This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. And today's guest for the final episode of This Is Horror 2021 is Jared Barbie of Death's Head Press, and this is a long one, so strap in, this is almost two hours of conversation you're going to get today, but you know what, you deserve it, so grab yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a little glass of bourbon, whatever you fancy, and find out a little bit about the Death's Head Press story, what they've been doing, how they've got there, and where they're going, but before any of that, a little bit of an advert break. Malene by Josh Schlossberg from DFT Publishing. The absent mindedness, the nonsensical ramblings, the blank stares. Ward Ayers, physically disabled and confined to his Jersey Shore home, can only watch in dismay as his beloved wife Malene slips further and further into dementia. Until finally, Ward uncovers a dark force behind Malene's decline and must plumb the depths of sacrifice and selfishness to reclaim his wife and preserve humanity's future. Find Malene in paperback, hardcover, ebook, or audiobook online or at a bookstore near you. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The Girl in the Video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Jared Barbie on This Is Horror. Jared, welcome to This Is Horror. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Now, to begin with, I want to talk about some of your first experiences watching horror movies. So my understanding is two of the movies that really made a big impact on you was Salem's Lot and Motel Hell. Oh, man, you've done your research. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Motel Hell was the first horror movie that I, I ever watched. I, uh, I had to sneak down to my aunt's house who had cable at that time. Uh, you know, cable, not everybody had it back then. It was like four channels. But So I snuck down there because I wasn't allowed to watch rated R movies either. Uh, and I uh, watched Motel Hell. And it, it was more campy. It didn't scare me. But then I, I saw Salem's Lot, and, and that movie really creeped me out. Uh, uh, I'm still, I still don't like to watch that movie. But, uh, yeah, so those were, were really the – Motel Hell was the first horror movie I saw, and then I think Salem's Lot was the first one that really scared me. Yeah, and when you say you had to sneak down to your aunt's house – do you literally mean sneak? Was it a case of like, I'm not going to be able to watch this shit. I've got to kind of bust out the house, go past my parents or, you know. It was. It was It was exactly like that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, I really wanted to. I mean, it wasn't really horror I was looking for. But then when I ran across it, I just wanted to go watch some probably MTV at that time. You know what I mean? It was when it first came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, uh, you know, I had been. They they restricted what I watched uh, a lot, uh, but as far as reading, they allowed me to read whatever whatever I wanted because they weren't really paying attention. Uh, is is my theory? But I was you know so I read a few horror novels and I was like yeah you know I I think this is uh so when I saw Motel Hell I couldn't pass it up yeah so yeah I watched it and been hooked ever since really. 
it was so campy, you know, uh, that horror, that kind of horror really doesn't ever scare a, a person. I don't think because it's the, it's the reality kind of horror. I, and I'm not saying Salem's lot is reality, but it's more plausible than uh, motel hell. Yeah. I mean, there's something really about the aesthetic of campy horror that just draws you in. I mean, it's a fucking spectacle. It is. It is. I, I love it. Uh, so that is, uh, is among my favorite kind of horror. Yeah. What were some of the books that you were reading back then? Oh, man. I, uh, God, what was I reading back then? You know, I read Jaws. Uh, it was uh, Stephen King. It was early in his career as well. So he had a bunch of good stuff. Carrie, uh, I, I believe, what was the other one? I Cujo and Silver Bullet I was reading. Uh, and then I read a lot of Brian Lumley. Uh, so the Necroscope series. So yeah, that's uh, and Necroscope was really a, a long read for somebody that age. Uh, but I really got into it. I really dug it. So what kind of age were you when you were, you know, watching these movies and reading these books? God, I, I mean, I, I can't give you an exact figure, uh, but I'm guessing I was, you know, eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there. Uh, so it was, it was early eighties. Let's see. So yeah, I'm going to say probably about 10 years old. Yeah. That's a fairly young age to experience Salem's lot. There's some fucked up scenes. <laughs> well, I'm, I don't think I saw the movie that early at 10. Uh, that was the motel hell. It was, uh, it was a few years after that and it was, it, it actually came on TV. So that was, uh, that was where I saw it the first time. Yeah. Yeah. It still creeped me out. It still creeps me out to this day. So, you know, that age was irrelevant on the creepiness for me. Uh, when a vampire is like scratching on the window, trying to get in, mm. that was, uh, it was pretty freaky. Yeah. So, Nosferatu looking bastard. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Yep. Well, I wonder if you think even further back, I mean, what do you think? some of the early life lessons were that you learned growing up in your formative years and that doesn't necessarily have to pertain to horror or writing it can just be any sort of life lessons in good old texas all right life lessons in texas i mean it's uh i would you know i'm generation x firmly uh firmly a latchkey kid so back then in in when i was growing up uh you know, both my parents worked, so I, I just came home from school from, I, I'm almost certain from kindergarten on up, and, I, you know, I was left alone to do my own thing, uh, so I learned a lot about <laughs> about doing things on my own, uh, so that was really a life lesson, because uh, you didn't really get a lot of assistance, you know, uh, so you just had to figure things out for yourself. I had, I had a lot of chores, uh, so I learned uh, a good, strong work ethic from a hard-nosed stepfather. Right. So but that's pretty much it. I mean, it, the light and, and keep uh, keep doing what you like to do. And uh, if you want something bad enough, if you keep working towards it, something's going to happen. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. My parents weren't uh, religious. But they weren't, uh, they were kind of prudes, you know, so uh, it, it wasn't based around religion, which was pretty cool. Uh, they never, I was never forced to go to church or anything like that, unless I visited my grandparents who were devout Pentecostals. So that pretty much turned me off of that uh, conventional religion right there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then pretty much, I mean, after that, uh, once I got into high school, we, we sort of moved out into the country side at in about i guess about seventh grade uh so we moved out into the sticks and i kind of took a turn for the worse i'm not gonna lie uh when doing right uh another life lesson is stay in school and uh and try to learn everything you can while you're young you're gonna need it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's it. it it always comes in handy any bit of knowledge you can glean uh from anything just try to store it up because eventually you'll need it oh know? yeah yeah 
Well, I guess a lot in terms of that hard work ethic as well, particularly came in handy when you were in the army. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I was in the army. I joined, uh, that was part of the thing with school. You know, I just decided I wanted to be away from home. Uh, and the easiest way was to join the army. So I, I joined really when I was 16 and then on my 17th birthday, I, I was headed for basic training. Yeah. So, uh, it was a little young for the army. Uh, I think, you know, you should, you should definitely wait a while, finish growing up first. So I got in a little bit of trouble in the army, uh, but nothing too serious. Uh, stayed in a few years and got out and it, the work ethic really, really helped since, uh, since I got out of the army, because, you know, when you, when you quit school early and you don't finish high school, your, your jobs are really limited. Uh, so you have to, uh, you have to go to blue collar type of work. And so that's what I did. Uh, and a good work ethic really gets you pretty far in the trades. You can really, uh, you can really do good things and, and make, make a lot of money. So that helped me throughout the years. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always staying employed and always hustling. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's something you need for small press and independent publishing because you're never going to be handed anything. You've always got to be constantly putting in the work. You do. You, I mean, you get into, you take out of it what you put in. If you're, if you're even a little lazy in small press, it, things build up. You start missing dates and you start disappointing your customers. And then that's really the beginning of the end. Yeah. So, and, and you got to have a lot of love too, because, uh, sometimes it doesn't love you back. And, uh, so you just got to keep plugging forward, especially with the small press. Oh yeah. Cause as you know, I mean, the, the margins are very narrow, so it's a, uh, it's a labor of love and, uh, got to like people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love, I love both. I mean, I don't mind putting in the work and, and people, I love talking to people. Uh, you know, it uh, took me a while to, to warm up to that side of it. But once you, uh, once you get around all these people, you realize that, you know, you found, you found a lot of people with, uh, the same likes and dislikes as you and, uh, just goes from there. Yeah. And in terms of, Death's Head Press, I mean, that formed in 2018, was it? 2018, it, is that right? It, it was. It was uh, 2018, and, and as Bob and I were talking about earlier, we really were born at uh, KillerCon in 2018. That was, uh, we, we'd rented a, we bought a table, uh, bought some space, you know, had a, had a concept for a book, and some really terrible stickers and bookmarks and uh, an even worse banner. Uh, we loaded that all up. We had no books. Uh, so we loaded it all up, headed to Austin, set it up and uh, really just uh, used Killer Conda Network and get get uh, and hell followed our, our first anthology, our first book put together, get some authors. And then we were born and we since then we've I think we've done pretty good, pretty good work. Yeah. And I mean, was this your first foray into kind of horror publishing and that kind of scene? Cause I know that you've obviously been a voracious horror reader for well, the majority of your life. You told us you, yeah. you started at, at eight yeah. years old, but I mean, was there anything kind of before death head, death's head press that you kind of did? Absolutely nothing. Uh, I was just a fan and it, it really started around the idea that there was a, a book that I wanted to read that wasn't out there. Uh, so, I mean, I just kind of threw my hat into the ring. Uh, I, I was friends with Patrick C. Harrison, my, uh, my partner and, in, in all of that starting up, we have since put on another partner, Jeremy Wagner. Uh, but back then it was me and Patrick, we were talking on the phone. I was like, you know, man, I had, it started out actually, I had invited him to do a story for it. And he was asking me questions like, uh, you know, so are you a legit press? Do you have a name? 
or what are you trying to do here? Just put this book together under Jared Barbie, uh, you know, and I, I got to thinking that he was, you know, probably right. Nobody was going to take me seriously if uh, I didn't have some sort of credentials. So I, from there, I, I asked him if he wanted to partner up and, and start a little press. Uh, and he said, yeah, you know, sure. So that's, that's, that's how Death's Head Press was formed. Uh, we, you know, we didn't, we've made a lot of mistakes, but we're, we're learning every, every book. So, I mean, we put out some good stuff. We put out some stinkers, uh, but yeah, that's when it formed. It was just an idea for a book. Yeah. What were some of the mistakes that you made? Oh man. Well, the first mistake you make, and I think every small publisher does this is, uh, let's see, I mean, I'm trying to think of the words to use for it is managing your expectations. You have these, uh, when in hell fought, when I was putting in hell followed together, you know, I was like, man, this is it. <laughs> I am going to, I am going to be rich off this book. Uh, you know, we have was deciding where to put the swimming pool and everything. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when when it came out and it sold like a hundred copies, I was, I was I was very disappointed. Yeah, you uh, can probably only get a paddling pool at that point. It's <laughs> like well, oh, yeah, humble like, beginnings and that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that was really the first lesson and and mistake is is managing your own expectations. Uh, it, it, it is, and even if no matter how good your book is, it's never going to sell as as much as you thought it would. Or on the flip side, you one that you don't really, I can't say don't think much of, but don't have as high aspirations, usually does does fantastic. So it's it's managing expectations. We uh, what other mistakes? I mean, there's so many uh, just small mistakes, you know, in formatting and. Uh, you know, getting the right people to do the stuff that you can't do. Uh, it's just all it marketing. You, you make a bunch of errors and you learn from each one. Yeah, but I think you must have learned, I mean, pretty fast. I mean, from just rocking up at KillerCon to where you are now. But I mean, you really seemingly hit the ground running. <clears throat> you got people like... Brian Keane and Raph James White, Early Doors. You've got these fantastic covers. I mean, and then there's the Splatter Western series as well. That really took off. So even though, you know, but by your own admission, you were making a number of mistakes, you must have been learning from them as quickly as you were making them. It, 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 and that's exactly what we were doing. Uh, like I said, each book you learn... You learn a little bit more uh, off each book and how to do these things. And it's it's really surrounding yourself with the the right people to help you. I mean, the the credit is so spread around for, you know, Death's Head Press and, and the, the success that we've had. I mean, we'd be here all night. You know, we, Lori Michelle of uh, Dark Moon Digest, uh, and everything she does our formatting and she's fantastic you know that's uh that's max wife max booth's wife um uh, she uh and then you it, the cover artist justin t coons you, you get the right guy in there to do covers and and they sell themselves like the splatter westerns uh and you, you got to have good editing and that's that's a big mistake that i think a lot of publishers early on make is with the editing because our when I'm going back looking at our books now and the editing errors in them, it's just it just makes you cringe. Uh, so that's it. Yeah, surrounding yourself with the right people. Yeah, and in terms of Laurie Michelle, she's someone who is almost an unsung hero of the genre because Laurie is formatting mm -hmm. so many more books than you would probably realize. Like she's probably oh, yeah. formatting like 70, 80 percent of, you know, the small presses within horror. She is a machine mm -hmm. and she's very good at what she does. She is great. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I mean, we tried to format our first few books we tried to do ourselves and I'm like, oh, I got to get somebody. You know, and then I had met Lori at KillerCon, and ever since then, I you know the the interiors of her books have been flawless. So yeah, yeah you're right. 
I guess it would surprise me because, you know, I, I only get the, hey, Laurie, I've got two books for you to format. And, and it's so quick and efficient. You wouldn't know that she's doing that many. You know? Yeah. So, because she also works. Uh, I think she's a dance instructor. That's right. So, yeah. She wears many hats. A lot mm-hmm. of respect to her. You know, she is one of the backbones of the uh, of the industry in small press. Horror. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you mentioned the initial anthology, so this is where it was all born with and hell followed. And I mean, this was essentially because you wanted to write a, a anthology. You wanted to put together an anthology based off revelation. So, I mean, what was the thought process there? I mean, one day you're sitting down and you're thinking, Revelations Horror Stories, let's do this. You know, what happened? It had, I mean, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. You know, I was like, man, I would like to read alternate takes because you're reading these different authors and you're like, you know, I wonder how he would write that. So I just, I got to thinking about it and I was like, you know, I want, I want like no boundaries to see what they're, what, how, fucked up that they can make the in the re- religious end times you know so and there were real there was a few books out there uh horror but there was no no great ones and yeah i wanted to read it and i have no talent for writing so i couldn't write my own stories and i just the guys that i like reading i decided to get stories from you know and that's another lesson you learn is not to be afraid to approach people and and see what you know if they want to work with you it's uh, all they can tell you is no yeah. but most of the time if if you're if you're coming up with a a good enough deal don't you know don't try to come at them with they they're doing this for a living a lot of times and they deserve you know they they deserve fair pay so don't don't you know for you know oh it's for the uh, for the exposure ah, that's not going to get you anywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, if you want if you, talent, you, <laughs> you got to pay for it. Yeah, if you come at uh, Raph James White with for the exposure, the only thing you might be getting is knocked to the floor. I don't think yeah. that'd be a good Raph idea. Is such a great dude. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. We approached him and he was all for it. You know, he did a story in uh, And Hell Followed, and then he, him and Christopher Rufty, they had a, a manuscript of something they wrote together, Master of Pain. So, you know, we, that's how it works. You treat somebody fairly once and they'll, they'll come to you again, you know, they, cause he was like, yeah, you know, you know, thanks for the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, Hey, I have this from with Christopher Rupti. Would y'all be interested in that? So, and then you just jump on things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, your love for horror isn't the only thing that you and Patrick have in common with, uh, Raf James White. Oh You're, my God! You have done your your homework. Yeah, well, you you said there was nothing off limits, and I said, well, let's let's fucking see about that. Let's see if we can yeah. test you. So I I know that you're all involved in the BDSM scene. So let's talk yeah. about that. It, this is true. It's just uh, it's a lifestyle that we all choose to live, uh, and we that is one of the things we share. Uh, it's an everyday lifestyle. Uh, we just uh, live a certain way and have our certain kinks. And so what else do you want to know about it? I'm an open book. Yeah. So did did you initially meet Patrick through horror or through BDSM? Or is there some fucking secret horror writers and lovers <laughs> that are into BDSM scene that no one's fucking invited <laughs> me to yet? Right. <laughs> uh, well, I- you know, I wish it was like that, but no, me and Patrick had met uh, on some BDSM groups on uh, Facebook. And uh, that is actually where we first met. And then I found out he was an author. And when I had the idea for the book and the anthology, I mean, he was really the only person I was author I was really talking to on a regular basis. So he was naturally the first one I went to. And, uh, you know, we had we shared a love of many things. So yeah, it was definitely a BDSM group that we first met. Yeah. Do you think you guys would 
consider putting out some sort of BDSM horror anthology? Is that a direction that you've kind of, I guess, r- ruminated on? Oh, uh, I mean, we put out an erotic horror uh, with uh, Obligator Voluptus. We've, we've actually done that, uh, but specifically BDSM, uh, I think it's been done. We haven't really played with the idea, you know, seriously. Uh, because I, I got to admit, the erotic horror, extreme horror book did not do that well. And it had some really great stories in it. So, I mean, that's something I don't think that the general public is is ready for or really cares about reading. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's yeah. it. Maybe it's too much of a niche. You've got a pretty big audience for, I guess, your more general horror. And there's a huge fucking yes. audience for erotic. But combine the two and it's like... We're ahead of the times, man. we got to wait 20 years. (laughs) Right. Maybe when we're dead, this book is going to go like, uh, I don't know. It's going on the New York Times, but uh, yeah. (laughs) Can you imagine that? (laughs) If it was on the New York Times bestseller. (laughs) Right. Obligator Voluptus, where it's got like stories like four heads, one dick or something (laughs) like that. So that would be, that would be magic. And I would be sad that I missed that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, in BDSM, really, honest to God, it's not this exciting, kink-filled uh, journey every day. It's not orgies every day. It's, uh, it's, it's just a way of living normally, just differently. So it's, it's, not, all, it's not all whips and, and chains. Yeah, got to be at least every other day, as you say. Yeah. Can't be yeah. every fucking it's day. A- <laughs> It's it's a chore. It's it, it's 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 tough to keep up with. Really, it's uh it's something else. If you want to truly live the lifestyle, it's it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say what I didn't think about was you know I I, I transitioned into talking about BDSM and it's like oh fuck how do I segue to anything else? <laughs> There's no fucking smooth segue once you've gone to BDSM. <laughs> I guess. Uh, hey, you slid it right in there. I mean, I was like, wow, I'm impressed. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he does that. Complaints about getting out of it, but yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just drop the next bomb and and let's move on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See if you can talk at least in enthusiasm. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I would personally, well, I would have saved that for towards the end of the show, but man, you you led with it. I'm, I am like much respect, bro. Yeah, we we, we gotta <laughs> you know we gotta hook people. We gotta get them to stick around, or you know get get a certain people to tune out. It's like, yeah, this isn't fucking for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, you, I was all with you until the BDSM segment. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, it's not a, it's not a, what everybody thinks it is. Yeah, but that, that should be like a kind of certain expectation as to the kind of things that we're going to talk about when it's like, look, we're talking to one of the founders of Death's Head Press. This is not like your kind of yeah, quiet I'm not a horror stuff. Teacher. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I say it's not all whips and chains, but sometimes it is. So it's quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it, man. But I mean, talk, talking about the kind of books that you're putting out and obviously like, you know, you've put out a number of extreme horror titles. Often we talk about pushing the limits and we'll say, ask different presses, you know, what's kind of something that would go too far in a book. Look, you're a fan of Raph James White. I don't think there's a fucking thing that's going too far in a book for you. You put out Dead Inside by Chandler Morrison. So on on the kind of reverse point, I mean, what do you think is as quiet a horror book as you would go? Is there almost like a minimum quota of gore that you'd need for a book to be considered Death's Head Press? Oh, to be considered Death's Head Press. Uh, well, I mean, we've set ourselves. I mean, I mean, this is a tough one because we're we're actually talking about this as a team within the within the press. Is if you if you stick with the um, pure extreme, you kind of put yourself in a box, mm. and it, you can find it tough to get out of. And we're we're kind of in that situation because we do want to branch out and we do want to do some quieter horror and you know be taken seriously about it so 
But once you get branded with that extreme uh, moniker, it's uh, it's hard. It's tough uh, to get out of it. But for I mean, up until this point, was there a minimum gore? Uh, yeah, there. I mean, there was. We wanted gore. We wanted in your face. We wanted to shock you. Uh, I mean, after Dead Inside, it, it was like I don't. I think we've reached the pinnacle. I don't think we can do any more shocking than that. Uh, so and the Wrath James White, uh, but yeah, I mean, no. It, to answer your question straight up, uh, there's no. We'll take quiet horror. We'll take psychological horror. Uh, we want to do it all. Actually, we just want to do good horror. Yeah, and it sounds like you've just put a challenge down because you said with Dead Inside we've reached the pinnacle. So for extreme yeah. horror authors listening, the challenge yeah. has been put down. <laughs> Prove him uh, I mean, wrong. you've got, some, you've got some, some guys that are writing some pretty gruesome stuff. You know, Aaron Beauregard uh, with his slob uh, books. I mean, those are those are pretty brutal. Uh, but I think I think the uh, I think Dead Inside, you know, it's on uh, a few months ago. It, it, uh, it a viral TikTok video went out about it. And uh, of course, sales shot up and I was really happy about that. But I mean, it's. When I'm having a bad day, I go read the reviews of Dead Inside. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of them, and and most of them are just funny. You know, like oh my god, I've got to bleach my eyeballs out, and it's it's made a lot of lists of the most disturbing books ever written. So, yeah, I'm proud of that book. Yeah, and I understand that some of the negative reviews have generated better sales for you both than you know the positive oh, ones. I I'm almost certain that that we have sold more books off the fact that people can't finish the book. You know, it, it, you said, a, I'm laying down a challenge. Well, that's once you lay down a challenge to people, they'll take, take you up on it. And I think that's what a lot of the sales were generated by. Oh, you think this is too extreme for me? Well, I'm just going to give it a shot. And then you, they say, yeah, yeah, I made a mistake. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. But <laughs> I think the book is so well written. I mean, the, the content of it is, is, disturbing uh but but the style of writing uh chandler does it, in that book especially uh it's just i think it's a thing of beauty yeah it's one and, of my favorite books yeah, yeah. and I, I think as well when like a book gets that kind of reputation or a story does it becomes a thing of legend i mean i guess what it was over a decade now when Chuck Polanik put out guts and people were yep. passing out, you know, at readings and stuff. And it was like, you know, you might <laughs> not be able to finish this. And it's like, well, there's a fucking sale because it's a yeah, challenge. Exactly. I mean, and I love guts. I, that was one awesome, one awesome story. Uh, yeah. Disturbing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. But. Chuck is definitely one of my favorite writers as well. Yeah, yeah. So, Me too. Uh, uh, but yeah, Chandler, I mean, and the cover on Dead Inside, I, that's one of my favorite covers that we've done. Uh, that was done by Danielle Batsheva. She does a lot of work for us now. Uh, but I just, because people look at that and they don't really know what they're getting into. They're, yeah. they're like flowers. Oh, there's a skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's mm -hmm. a there's a beautiful woman on the backside. So. And then they and they crack it open. It's like, oh, oh whoa. Mm -hmm. I listened to it on audio. We, uh, I forgot the guy's the narrator's name is Daniel something, but the dude nails the character one hundred percent. The deadpan, you know, it, it's just fantastic. So if you if you can get the audio book, get the audio book. Yeah. So is, is that put out via Death's Head Press? Are you putting audiobooks out too? Yeah, yeah, we do it. We do it through uh, uh, ACX, which mm. is Amazon as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, trying to live without Amazon in publishing is almost like trying to live without oxygen these days. <laughs> yeah, I just don't and think it's, it's a smart it's, business move. I mean, you know. No, <laughs> we, no neither, neither do I. But I just... You can't live without you. Know, I mean, it, some way or another, whether you print your own books or or go through a distributor, you're going to be dealing with Amazon anyway. 
Yeah. If you put out books, you're dealing with Amazon. Mm. And uh, that's why Bezos is one of the richest men in the world. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. So, uh, and and we just we just I can I can say it now. We just got a huge distribution deal with a uh, independent book. Independent publishers group IPG out of Chicago, uh, and even they they're like, well, I mean, you may not like it, but you're going to be on Amazon's tip from now on. So, yeah. How did you get involved with IPG? Ah, that's a uh, so my partner in uh, Stygian Sky. I know we've been talking about Deathhead Press, but I do have another imprint, another press, uh, Stygian Sky Media, and my partner there is Jeremy Wagner. And uh, so he he knew the guy from Publishers Weekly, the editor of Publishers Weekly, uh, Kevin, and he dropped. Uh, Kevin was kind enough to put our name in the IPG folks's ear, and we got we got a an appointment to go meet with them. Uh, flew up to Chicago, and one thing led to another, and we we're in a two year deal with them to distribute our books and that's that's a really huge deal because when you're a small press that's really the next step up you know from doing your your kdp and your ingram sparks mm. uh it's it's really achieving that next level and and it's for both both presses stygian sky and uh death's head press so and that's going to help us and that's going to help the authors get their name out there a bit better uh Hopefully, we're going to sell more books. I, I'm pretty sure we will, because uh, they also just bought the biggest distri uh, book distributor in the UK. I forgot what the name of it was, but it was just announced. So it's pretty much a worldwide deal now, and uh, we're really proud of it. So. Yeah. Are you able to go into more of the details of that? I mean, I'm wondering what kind of and a percentage they're taking and what they can do for you like i mean obviously as you say they're one of the biggest distributors but what kind of things are they asking for and what kind of things are they promising right well i you know i don't i won't don't feel comfortable giving out the exact details of the deal because i'm not sure they would appreciate it but they get they get a healthy chunk uh a healthy percentage but what they bring to the table is uh, worldwide coverage, uh, some really focused uh, marketing strategies, uh, promotions, uh, and really just using the IPG name when you're when you're at trade shows. Uh, it, it's just it helps to legitimize your your company, and people know that you can uh, you can deliver. Uh, because someone had the faith enough in you to want to distribute your books. Yeah, I mean, and and like I said, they uh, they do they do take their their share, but it's worth it. So far, we're very early in this deal. Uh, it's it's it changes the whole way you really do business in small publishing. So you have to you have to start conforming to a different set of a different way of doing things. Uh, you know, usually with up till now, we you know we'll announce a book. You know, three months later, it's in people's hands. It's not that way uh, when you're dealing with the distributor. You've got to give them at least six months. It's a six month lead time on a book, and that's to take care of all the uh, promotion and the and the marketing of that book. So when it does come out, uh, your sales are as projected. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the marketing, is that anything that IPG get involved in or is it purely distribution in terms of their role? Well, actually, I mean, IPG is is I mean, they're a juggernaut. They they do. They while they don't do the marketing and promoting themselves, they 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 work with groups that do and they they guide you over to them and help you with the strategy uh i mean you're, you're you're still you're still doing your own marketing but they're they're like hey this is what our our studies have shown is a good move for for you right here um so that and they also print books they have a print on demand service just like amazon so you can 
So we're going to put our titles with them and it's still going to be print on demand for the paperbacks. Only we've seen their facility and it's a really high quality product. Uh, they're, they're putting out a hundred thousand books a month there right now. And with the addition of the UK, I'm sure they're going to at least double that. Yeah. So does that mean you're moving away from Ingram completely? So all of the printing now is going to be IPG? Yeah, that is the plan. And we we don't really use Ingram. We use uh, uh, KDP mostly. Right, right. Uh, uh, but even on some titles, I think that they'll still, they'll still use Ingram to print our books. Mm. Uh, it's really, it, it, I, I don't really know. I can't go into the details of that because I really don't know them fully, but it may be every title will be, uh, and it's just on paperbacks. Our hard covers, we're still going to have to do ourselves. And we have a bindery here in Texas that we, we do all the printing for that. Uh, it's a little small family run business. Uh, really like to support places like that. Uh, so it's in Bastrop, Texas as well. So we're, we're going to be printing our own hardcovers and little special edition chat books, but we'll still distribute them through IPG. We'll just, they have the storage facility. So we'll just do a print run and send them to them and get them, get them printed up and get them sold. Yeah. And in terms of special editions, I mean, I believe that this is, one of the big focuses with the new venture, Stygian Sky Media, with Jeremy Wagner. Also, Jeremy is an accomplished writer and a guitarist yeah. for the awesome death metal band Broken Hope. So there's a bit of a plug for them. It is. He, he, he is great mm -hmm. band. Yeah. Great band. Yeah. But He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are definitely going to get him on the show at some point as well but i mean rather than have you both on together it was like no this is an excuse to have you both on separately and you know we can dig into like your solo projects as well because I, I don't know if you'd have wanted really like right this is the 40 minute segment where you shut the fuck up and jeremy talks about <laughs> death metal maybe that'd be have you seen all the other podcasts that we've been on then i i take it so uh yeah see <laughs> jeremy's life is way more interesting than mine so uh yeah you're you're gonna find that that interview a lot better than this uh, but... <laughs> don't, don't say that <laughs> <laughs> like you you texting people are meant to be really confident always bigging yourself up it's meant to be me as the british person that's meant to be self-deprecating <laughs> oh well you know i worked with brits for 10 years straight so i guess it rubbed off on me yeah. uh, i worked offshore in west africa and it was all scots and brits uh with a few filipinos sprinkled in so so hang on we uh, were you living in west africa well, I wasn't living there. I worked offshore on an oil platform, so I would uh, I would fly and 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 do thirty days there, and then thirty days at home. So, uh, yeah, I did that for ten ten years. I can't believe that the thing you literally said before that was like, yeah, my life isn't that interesting. Oh, I worked offshore <laughs> in West Africa, uh, dude. That's interesting uh, been, shit. <laughs> oh, is it? I've I've been working offshore for oh, almost thirty years now. So I guess when you do it all the time, it doesn't really seem like much of anything because it's quite boring. Right. I'm good to be honest. It's it's mainly uh, you go there, you spend your 30 days and it's uneventful. I mean, there are some events in West Africa. It was pirates. You know, we would uh, I mean, every couple of trips, it would be, you know, pirates trying to board where you were at. But it, uh, other than that, you know, no, no serious explosions or. I mean, I've seen some serious fires, but never been involved in them, thank goodness. But I'm not offshore anymore. Now I'm in a, um, I took a land-based job in a local, uh, I guess, or a chemical plant, refinery. So that's what you do around this, these parts. You work for oil and gas. Yeah, you, you can't just say, oh, it's pretty boring. The only event that occasionally happens is pirates trying to board where you're at. That is not, that is not a boring, uneventful <laughs> thing to happen. I mean, what, what I, the fuck? <laughs> I mean, when it happens a few times after like the third time, it's like, oh, pirates again. Jesus Christ. Uh, they get become to the a safe, nuisance. <laughs> yeah, get, get to the safe haven. Uh, or, you know, you start trying to throw stuff at them just to, 
because they it's funny because they the the platform I was on is called an FPSO. So it's it's basically they bought this old oil tanker. So it's actually a ship, but it's permanently anchored to the seabed. Uh, and there was there was a few different platforms, but they all pumped oil to this place and it would kind of refine pre-refine it before it would go to land. Uh, so the pirates, how they would get on board would be climb up the anchor chains. Uh, and you had a, a pretty good while, like if you had some big nuts and bolts, you could knock a few of them off the chains because uh, they couldn't really, they had their guns strapped on their back, but they couldn't get to it because they're climbing up an anchor chain. Uh, so, I mean, it was, it was fun in a way, but I mean, the first couple of times were kind of spooky. You know, and when mm. the, the first time you hear them actually shoot, you know, because you know that you're on, you're like, there's thousand pound pressure oil running through all of these lines and mm. a spark could blow the whole place up. It wasn't really the, the fear of getting shot. It was the fear they're going to blow us all up. So because it was West mm. Africa, it was not the best maintained <laughs> facility in the world. Right, right. Man, you have like completely ruined my entire concept of modern pirates. This yeah, is ta- you're talking to somebody who grew up reading Treasure Island, who when he realized that Black Sails was a prequel to Treasure Island, I was like, I'm getting stars today. And well, I, now pirates are like bumbling fools who are trying to <laughs> blow up platforms with shooting stuff. And you can knock them off the anchor chains with bolts. Yeah. Fucking pirates, bolts. man. Y'all, pirates have turned into big wumps. That's all. Yeah, there. You would be very <laughs> disappointed in these pirates, Bob. They are most of them are <laughs> like fourteen years old. You know, just right. doing what they're told. You know, the the guns right. almost as tall as they are. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, it, it's sad in a way when you're over to somebody to to go to those lengths to get a, a couple of laptops because there was nothing they could get on that boat. You know, we didn't have any money. We were offshore. I mean, what are we gonna buy? Uh, so. <laughs> There's not a lot of money. Uh, nobody was going to pay any ransom for any of us on board that thing. So, I mean, it was just sad. It got to be the maintenance on the ship got so bad that some pirates would actually throw stuff up to us uh, instead of trying to board and, and take anything. So that was kind of embarrassing. Oh, man. You became a charity like, case for the pirates. Yeah, it's, it's like, wow. Yeah, we don't want to board you. These bumbling pirates. The guy gets up on the platform. I'm the captain now. We ain't going fucking nowhere, buddy. Yeah. I mean, it's not going anywhere. It's been here for 30 years. Yeah, so, no shit. Uh, oh, man. So it, I mean, it was it was an experience. I, I met a lot of great people offshore. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I guess, an adopted Brit now. Uh, I still use all the slang at home. And uh, so... It's weird. I, I eat like I eat with a fork and a knife now on every meal. So I I definitely picked that up. Oh, hang on, do Americans not eat with a knife and fork? Well, we use when we use a fork, we don't use a knife for everything. Like you guys literally <laughs> use a knife for everything. Like, it's true. You know, to, to put it on the back of your fork, you know, and yeah. you got to get some mashed potatoes and you got to get a little of this <laughs> and put it on the fork. And you, you do, and you do that with the knife. And uh, y'all use a fork completely different than we do. We don't use the back of the fork here. So it's 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 a bit different. Well, mm-hmm. we've been cooled but out. <laughs> we've huh? been cooled out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad because it is. It I can do both now. So, I'm, I mean, I'm ambi culinary now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always thought you used the back of the fork so you could get like less food on the fork. Oh, but, no, you know, because I mean, like the way, I, the way I, what's that? <laughs> so these Brits have got this down. They can put some some food on the back of a fork. Yeah, and it all makes it to their mouth. Yeah. So I have to use a fork like a fucking shovel. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely. And I'm like, hey, look, I have a spoon that doesn't have any tines. I can get more food on it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And see. But that a little bit of information there about the the use of the knife and fork actually came in handy for me one year on uh we went to this murder mystery dinner uh in houston uh on new year's eve so you you eat the dinner and the whole time you know somebody at your table is the murderer you know and you've got to 
to figure it out. Well, I figured it out because there was a guy there who was claiming he was blah, 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 but he ate just like a Brit with a knife and fork. So that started me thinking and, and sure enough, I put two and two together and it was him, so, but it was that information that, that gave him away. Just a little funny story. Yeah. Well, damn. If we're ever in that kind of situation, now you two have passed that knowledge on to us. So if there's a right. mystery, you got to look how people are eating. Cause that you gotta, might be you gotta the... pay attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, somehow I started asking about Stiggy and Sky Media and we just spoke about pirates. So I'm just going to fucking try again. Right. So tell us about okay. this new business venture of yours. All right. So I'm going to stay on topic this time. So me and Jeremy, Jeremy approached me. He, uh, he has this archive of uh, a guy named Gene Ambo. He's a photographer. And he's shot all these huge bands over the years for the past 30 years, uh, done these concert tours with these bands and taken the pictures of these bands. And he's got all these photos and Jeremy wanted to make a photo book. And he was asking if Death's Head Press was interested in doing something like that. Uh, you know, and I was like, you know what, that's, that's way outside our wheelhouse. Uh, that's not even, it's on a different free, freeway, let alone in our lane. I said, but what about, you and I starting a press up and we, we do something with all these photos. And he was like, wow, you know, I never thought of that, you know, uh, but he came around and he's like, yeah, man, let's do this. Uh, so we started up Stygian Sky, uh, and then really we're like, Hey, you know, we don't just want to put out, you know, photography books from this one guy. So let's, let's expand and let's, uh, let's do dark fiction, crime noir, uh, anything, really that's dark except extreme we wanted to stay as far away from extreme as possible because we had death's head press for that mm. uh any extreme more extreme work came we could just funnel it to that i mean at that time jeremy wasn't a partner in death's head press but recently we merged and we all became partners you know so uh really death's head press and stygian sky under the same umbrella now uh but and then we and then we started in earnest. We we've got a we've got a book from uh, Ross Jeff. Well, it's a re-release from Ross Jeffrey, uh, his Tome and Juniper books, mm -hmm. which he's writing the third that we we were going to publish. It's called Scorched. Uh, and then we got an Eric LaRocca collection of two novellas that we're going to be putting out. Uh, I, I don't know the name right off the top of my head, and I'm yeah. sorry, Eric. And Eric uh, LaRocca, I mean their novella that they put out earlier this year has absolutely exploded i mean far more than like it i mean that that's the unicorn that is like the exception to the rule in terms of like an independent release just how fucking quickly it's been in the the zeitgeist i guess for yeah. for everyone well, see, the, the thing with that, I was just on a podcast with Sam, uh, and we we talked about that, and it was a TikTok video as well that really kicked that that book up to the next level. Uh, so, I mean, there's something to be said for this TikTok. I immediately went out and started a, started a profile, but so far I've only been looking at stupid videos for hours a day, so I haven't really done anything <laughs> with it. But uh, No, Phil, yeah, man, man. that's me. Yeah, so yeah. You've, been, you've been entertained, but not productive. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I've been, haven't been productive at all. But it, it's so I, I could spend hours on TikTok. It's it's hilarious. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, that book is amazing, and Eric LaRocca is an amazing writer. So we, we got those, and then our we just we just got our biggest acquisition because we're. We're trying to be next level publishers. We want to put out good books. Uh, we want to put out a lot of memoirs. So uh, I went and had a meeting with Mr. Joe Lansdale and we signed him to do his autobiography Dude. called the, Me the Mechanic Son tentatively. Uh, it's coming out in 2023, but uh, yeah, we're trying to elevate it. And the Joe Lansdale thing is, well, we're proud of that. Let's Let's put it that way. Yeah. Is that a This Is Horror exclusive? Have you announced that anywhere yet? Yeah, we announced it. We did a publisher's marketplace announcement on it. I mean, because that's big news. I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, he's never, Joe Lansdale's never 
written um, his memoirs, and now he is, and he's a fascinating dude. I mean, I've had mm-hmm. lunch with him a couple of times, and it's just that's where the idea came from. I was like, I got to get these these stories. That's, he's got to write these down, and I want to publish it. So, yeah. Uh, uh, but absolutely, a, a, one of the greatest human beings around. Uh, great ambassador of the genre, uh, and an all around great guy. Uh, we can't wait to put that out. Yeah. So. I mean, Joe could tell you about his shopping trip and it would be interesting. He's just got Absolutely. such a way. Yeah. So he's pure Texas too. He's pure East Texas. And I love that. Uh, but yeah, we're also doing a, we're reissuing a book called the intruder from Peter Blonner. We actually are, are going to do his entire backlist. Um, uh, this is one of Stephen King's favorite uh, crime writers. Uh, the Intruder was his, his best-selling book, and the 25th anniversary is coming up. So uh, we got the rights to that. We're going to reissue that in, uh, in some special editions. So, yeah, things things for Stygian and Sky are looking really, really good right now. Uh, we're doing good things, and we've got the distribution deal. So, I mean, we're we've got all the tools. So we just need to take over the world now, uh, one book at a time. Yeah, well, King really heaped on the praise for Blauner in both Dan's Macabre and on writing. So he, he's been kind of singing his praises for years now. When we first started Death's Head Press, we had open submissions and everything like that. Uh, we've gotten away from that because that is a... That is a nightmare I never want to live through again. Even though you get a lot of great stories and everything, and a lot of people who normally wouldn't get a chance to to pu- get their work published, you get a lot of stories like that. It is for and hell followed when we put out the call. We didn't we didn't think we were going to get a lot of people. I'm sorry, I did, I said and hell followed. That was that was uh, invitation only mm-hmm. uh, for our next one. Uh, Dig two graves. We did a open call on that and we had like 600 submissions and it's just uh you can't keep up like that with the two-man operation there's no way it's impossible yeah so yeah. we've kind of moved to the invitation only uh well every once in a while if we get a recommendation from somebody that we've already worked with we'll uh we'll take an unsolicited submission but it's still if that's the case it's it's kind of solicited. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So it's so how we went on. And with Stygian and Sky, we're moving towards uh, more agented work. While it's no fun dealing with agents a lot. Uh, it's just a, it's just a different kind of way of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. Before we were talking about the different roles at Death's Head Press, and of course it started off with you and Patrick, with Patrick taking a more editorial role and you taking a more marketing role, but with regards to the marketing, I mean, you've now got Sadie Hartman, perhaps best known as Mother Horror, and she's taken a kind of social media and publicist role so how did you get involved with sadie and what kind of things is she doing uh well i me and sadie of course we met on facebook or twitter uh and she started reviewing the splatter western books you know she she wanted to do the whole series on on uh with her night worms to uh to review them when that was I think she's gotten away. Nightworms no longer does it has the whole review thing anymore. I I don't think. But anyway, at that time she did. So she was reviewing the books and and really uh, kind of responsible for their their mass appeal. I mean, well maybe not for the appeal, but getting the word out about them. And uh, so I I credit her a lot with the success of those. So you know, the further we went along with the reviews. And talking, I was like, why don't you, you know, come on board and help us out with our social media and, you know, make posts and, and things like that. Uh, so really that's how that got started. And she was like, sure, I'd love to do that. Uh, and then we just, when we started Stygian Sky, we just 
extended it over to that and she she took the role on and i believe she's doing pretty pretty well uh she's a great person as well as you know everybody involved and i love her like a sister she's uh she's not only you know a business associate but she's a really really good friend so uh, and, um, i value her opinion and i value what she does for us so i want to uh, keep her keep her working with us yeah and it's pretty evident from talking to you and having spoken with Sadie before that you both work horses you both have that same kind of work ethic and grinding and getting stuff done so I mean that's yes. the kind of people you know you, you want to attract people like that for your business and to make Death's Head Press as successful as it can be yes and she's you know she has the same goals she wants she everything she touches she wants to be a success yeah. uh, and I, I feel the same way. And she works towards that goal uh, relentlessly. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, it is her work. I think is a big part of it. Uh, so, I she is a workhorse. I mean, she puts me to shame. And that is probably not such an easy task to put you to shame either. Oh, you know, no, it's not an easy task, but she does it. Yeah. She, uh, <laughs> She keeps me in check too, uh, you know, because like I said, I like to go on Twitter and and sometimes start a little shit, and she really, <laughs> yeah, uh, she really has ended that for me. She's like she chastises me a yeah. lot. So you got to be pretty, fucking I, careful with that, man. There's no uh, room for nuance on Twitter. <laughs> oh, I know. Mm -mm. I, I've learned that. I, you know, it's it's even though sometimes I know it and I know what I'm typing is wrong and I should not hit that inner key. I do anyway. Uh, and she's there to, uh, to let me know how, how bad I fucked up. So uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and she's threatened to change the passwords on everything where I can't even get into it. So I had to really, <laughs> had to really, really tone it down. Uh, so. mm -hmm. I was going to say, open up a word doc rant, save it. Just don't do it on Twitter. That's what I do now, man. I have I have probably about fifty or sixty fucking rants. <laughs> yeah, I, because, I, just, I, mean, I just have a low tolerance for bullshit, and when I see mm -hmm. some bullshit, I mean, that's I guess it might be a Texas thing, but I just I can't tolerate bullshit. And I feel like I have to say something about it. Well, I did. Okay, Sadie, if you're listening, I I don't do that anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Uh, you just got to let it go because, you know, really, you know, Twitter is Twitter and it's not real life and not as many people really give a shit what's going on as you think. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Just so you're seeing that, you, you know, you got this focus on these people because they're associated with the same people you are. And it's just so you see all their bullshit and you're really one of the few that do. So I've learned that mm -hmm. and just let it all go. It doesn't make a, a shit. Yeah, you don't see Simon and Schuster on Facebook. You don't see, you know, Penguin. They're not doing shit on Twitter. So, man, no. Wouldn't it be interesting if Penguin just started <laughs> tweeting out shit about Simon and Schuster? Like, if it turned right. into some sort of pro wrestling promos, I would, I would mm -hmm. fucking be all in for that. Yeah. <laughs> that would, be, I would be awesome. I would be tuning in like yeah. a daily fucking thing. But, uh, but they don't do that because they they realize it, it doesn't really. At the end of the day, it doesn't really mean shit. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, we, you know, so far with Death's Head Press and Stygian Sky, our our marketing plan has revolved a lot around social media, uh, you know, with the Twitter and Facebook. And, but we're getting away from that. That's, that's the thing with, you know, doing the distribution thing is you definitely have to keep your nose clean on social media. Uh, because you've got more at stake, you know, there's, uh, not only your money, but you're messing with other people and it, it gets to be a whole thing. Uh, but that's not where we're, we're starting to move into marketing through like publishers weekly. We're going to, we're doing, actually, we're going to be on the cover on December 20th of publishers weekly. We've got a big, uh, we've got the cover and another three pages in there and we're hoping to get a, a spotlight in there, but yeah, so we want to, we want to do the, you know, Publishers Weekly, the trade magazines, uh, Publishers Marketplace, and just mm -hmm. really get away from the, the drama and everything surrounding social media. 
Yeah. And well, of course, and of course, those magazines are trade magazines. So that's where you're going to get into your bookstores and and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, I think to begin with, a lot of small presses um, wise to kind of focus on that more organic marketing strategy where you're not having to kind of pay to be in these magazines. So you build up your reputation through social media, through, you know, genre specific websites and podcasts and things of that nature. But yeah, if if you then start to kind of accrue the finances, then going into a place like Publishers Weekly, I mean, that, that yeah, it's always a risk reward. You got to work mm-hmm. out, you know, what kind of return on investment do I think I'm going to get? So, I mean, I wonder on that basis, how do you make a decision, you know, where you put your money with the marketing? What makes you think, yeah, I'm going to go for this with Publishers Weekly. I think it's worth taking that chance. Well, I mean, that's a gamble. It, it's really gamble. Uh, and this is, where we are that is where we're at right now we don't know what the returns are going to be yet because it's it's a new marketing strategy for both for both presses so this is how we choose to try to do it and if i mean naturally if it doesn't work out we'll, we'll be back here on social media no but we're, we're never going to leave social media yeah. but uh it's it is a you've got to really look at it when you put in that because it's not cheap uh, so we're going to invest the money now and we'll see where it, it puts us in six months and hopefully it's going to, to work well. And I think it will. Yeah. I guess, you know, to add a further complication to marketing, there's not always that immediate return, you know, it's, it's a long term game. So it's about kind of putting death's head press in the consciousness of different writers and readers and bookstores so that that kind of advert or that piece in publishers weekly you know it might be okay that's something that implants the idea of death's head press but then they see you again and they see you again and it's like okay i I think these uh motherfuckers are up to something because right. that that's how mm-hmm. all professionals in publishers refer to people as motherfuckers in fact so yeah, that is absolutely. what they would say <laughs> yeah and see and it's it all it you, you go and and like you said you can't it can't when you go for a marketing scheme like like that it can't be a one-off because you know anybody can do a one-off in a magazine and it's going to be you're going to remember that that press for that issue and yeah. then If you don't see their name again, you're going to forget about them. So, and that is, you know, we're doing the, the publishers weekly. We're going to try to get Kirkus and, you Mm -hmm. know, all the big magazines and then the publishers marketplace, uh, announcements, you know, we've decided to announce everything on there, uh, instead of just doing a tweet about it, you know, so we'll announce it there first and we'll actually tweet the, uh, the announcement on publishers marketplace. So it's just, and it does take some money. I'm not going to lie. And that's, uh, you know, Jeremy coming into the organization and us starting has helped us out a lot. So uh, there we go. It's it's really Jeremy's investment in us that's driving this. And we're going to see how it goes. I don't, I feel when I'm spending somebody else's money, I'm even more attuned to what's going on than when I'm spending my own. So. Mm-hmm. Well, I can say that the publisher's marketplace, no matter who's putting it out, those those social media texts, when they quote from there, they get my attention. I read that shit. Not right. that I don't read other people's, you know, tweets about their, their work and what they have coming out. But just seeing that text in that little, you know, that little picture, I'm like that. I read every single one of them. I might not even be interested in the book, but that stuff's right. eye catching. It is. And. And really, it uh, I, I don't want to say it gives the impression of professionalism, but it does because, you know, people mm-hmm. realize that you're you're going out of your way to to announce this stuff uh, and not just just making a tweet about it. So I think it, it it's just all part of a, a, a big plan, you know, a big. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think and I think like you said, I think a lot of people think like you do, Bob, and and we're betting on that. 
that people think like that. That's that's mm -hmm. the risk. That's the gamble. Yeah, it gives you a sense of legitimacy. And and, and again, I want to emphasize that you know I'm not saying that that anyone else who doesn't use it is not being legit. Correct. It's just it's just that that there's it's a sliding scale, and that that's a little higher up. I mean, you know, it's, and definitely there's some people out there who probably don't use that at all. Uh, who are masters of marketing, and I envy how they do it. Yes. Uh, and they they typically just use anything that they can get their hands on that's free, and they they have learned how to do it without being annoying and without you know having me mute them or block them because okay, damn it, I'm I'm tired of seeing your book, uh, you know, and it, it's just you know you got to use your resources. You have to take advantage of what you can. Yeah, and, yes, I agree. You know, and so, you know, but that that level of legitimacy uh, and professionalism that that it brings to the table is it it's it definitely catches my eye every single time. And I and, and yeah, I and I'm hoping like at least three or four million people feel exactly like you do. Yeah. And start yeah. buying Death Head Press and Stygian and Sky Books. Uh yeah. so uh but yeah, and and that's that's just taking it to the. It's a natural progression when you're publishing that that's where you go. So I mean, it it's when you're inside looking, you know, looking at it, then different from the outside. That's 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 what you're you're shooting for. I mean, that is what differentiates a hobby press sometimes from somebody who's wanting to do it uh, more on a full time basis. And I'm not saying. You know these small presses or hobby presses. That's not what I'm um, I'm talking about. But when you when you're literally trying to this to be your nine to five job, that's the progressions that it, it needs to take because that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to get your name in front of more people uh, in order to do that. So that's what we're, I'm trying to do. I don't want to be an oil uh, oil filled trash forever. So yeah, yeah, and I'm wondering in terms of the the makeup of like uh, Death's Head Press. I mean, as we said, it started off with you and Patrick, so kind of 50-50 ownership, but with with Jeremy, so is it now like a kind of freeway split or is he playing more an investor role? I'm just trying to get a sense no, it's, of... Mm. It's straight up three-way split. Uh, he's a, a full partner in in the business. Uh, so it's it's... Definitely a three-way split. He's involved 100, 100%. So he's not just investing his money and stepping away and waiting for the profits. He's involved now. Yeah. Uh, in in all facets of it, we 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 usually we'll get together and do Zoom meetings once a week uh, with with us and Sadie. And we also just put on an intern. Uh, we brought a, a a girl named Anna Kubik, who's an MFA student at DePaul uh, mm -hmm. there in Chicago who's helping us out as well. Uh, so it, it's gotten to that point where you, you can't handle it all yourself. So, but yeah, Jeremy's definitely 100% partner in it. Uh, now, Patrick, he's the only partners. We're only in Death's Head Press, but uh, you know, never know what may happen eventually. He's not involved in Stygian Sky much right now, but since the companies have kind of merged mm. under one umbrella, you know, that's that's the next logical step that we'll look at further down the road. Yeah. And at the free, are you taking much of a pay packet? Because, I mean, the way that you're kind of talking about things, I get the impression that you're probably investing much of the money just straight back into the company. We have taken exactly zero dollars since its inception. So, no, there's no pay package. And like you said, we're we're turning the money inward. Uh, so we've uh, we've. All of us have gotten together and decided once we make, if it starts taking off and we make this much money, then we'll start dispersing, you know, money out. But until we do that and we have a a, a big cushion, we're not going to take any money out of it. But we're hoping to to end that uh, attrition, hopefully by the end of next year. Yeah, yeah. It's not a lot of money involved when you when you're dealing. I guess uh, bigger things and you're doing, there's just, there's not much left at the end of the day until you've got a good catalog and it's all selling. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And in terms of the audio books, are you getting narrators on a kind of 50-50 split in terms of royalties? Or are you kind of paying the narrator and then you take, you know, whatever royalties you get? So far on the audio books, since we're, we're, new, we're basically new at it, we're, we just started it probably in or mid to early 2020. Uh, we're... We're going on ACX and you you split the royalties in one one other. They have like two packages that you can do. So we started out uh, and what we're continuing to do right now is is it's a royalty split with the narrator. And he so he gets his money directly from ACX. Uh, we're not even involved in that, which is good because it helps me. And I don't have to pay royalties, you know, and figure them out. Uh, and then so. Amazon gets the bulk of the money and then uh, I think there's 40% left over. So the narrator gets 20% and then the author and us split, tem- uh, split the other 20%. So we end up getting 10% on that. Yeah. The author gets 10% and the narrator gets 20. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I've been putting out a number of audio books and I've also been using ACX, but I, I just pay the narrator and so then once they've taken that, you know, they're paid, <laughs> that, that's that. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the royalties will be between me and the author or in the case of when I just put out the girl in the video audio book, well, that's all for me, baby. But that's all for you. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it is, it is pretty expensive paying the, narrator up front so i mean i i'm kind of i'm considering you know looking into this royalty split but also i've got a problem now where you know rj bailey who i've been using he's just so fucking good and once you find someone who's good at what they do you know you you want to keep them but i i do think the audio much like other things in publishing you know we're playing a long game here because there is quite um, an upfront cost if you pay that narrator in in full. Yeah, it's yep. going to take a while to make that back. But I mean, I do think that, you know, in, in terms of the popularity of audiobooks, that's going to keep growing and growing. So this is like future proofing in a way. Right. I think we're we're thinking about moving towards just paying the narrator. We're actually wanting to move totally away from ACX and, mm. you know, having a studio and just engineering our own audio books. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're, we're a ways away from that, but it's just an idea that's in the pipeline uh, because the, 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 the fewer people you involved with it, the more you're going to get out of it. Uh, yeah. I mean, it may cost you a bit more up front, but like you said, the law on the long game, you're going to come out ahead. Uh, and with the royalty split, if your book, if your audio book starts really booming, you have really tied your hands on the amount of royalties you're going to pull out of that book if you if you do the royalty share. Yeah. I mean, you're going to make a narrator's day, but you at the end of the day you've you're leaving money on the table that sh- you could have you could have taken. So. Yeah, yeah. It's all about you know making the best choices that you can at the time. If you haven't got the money to pay it up front, then you got to go with the royalty shares. But if if you do have that money, then, you know, it's something to consider. I, I think, you know, in, in publishing, as with many things, there are no definitively right answers or right options, just different avenues and roads that you can take. Right. Absolutely. And, and you just realize that every decision you make is either... Because every dollar you spend on a book is does come off the bottom line of that book, and and that's really, uh, I mean, sometimes you can put a, as little, you know, you can have a, a shoestring budget on a book, and you actually end up making more than on some of your major productions, and mm. it's really weird. Publishing is a really weird, a really yeah. weird thing. Yeah, the, the the audience is is fickle, and you never ever know what they're gonna that they really want you know some you didn't think that they were going to be interested in they they eat it up so yeah i'm learning you just got to roll with it and and pay attention to the trends 
and uh, and hedge your bets. Yeah. Well, if you think about the kind of longer term plan, where do you see yourself in five years? Whew, well, I'm hoping. OK, so in five years and that's a, a good time frame because sort of we're given this five years. Uh, I'm hoping that both companies are self-sufficient and paying for themselves. Uh, you know, we don't, we're not having to come out of pocket to invest any more money. Uh, and we're pulling some, uh, pulling some money yearly out of the uh, company for each, each partner. Uh, I would like to see all of our books in bookstores, uh, and me not working in the oil field anymore, just, uh, concentrating on this as my nine to five job. Uh, and just really putting out quality. I still want to put out quality material. I want to, I want to help uh, unknown authors get out there. I want uh, I want both both companies to uh, to be somewhere that people want to publish with, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I want to be, I want I want us to be seen as uh, decent to work with, uh, fair, and uh, and generous with our with the people that work with us, and not just greedy fucks trying to stick our hands in their pockets right right yeah well so that, that's what i see for us i just want to be i want i want everybody involved with this to be successful mm, mm. and presumably you must be pretty happy with you know the progress thus far i mean all the things you're doing they really spell professionalism and i mean we've spoken about some of the writers that you've got and also some of the recognition, particularly in the Splatterpunk Awards. Yeah, I mean, I was really, I'm really shocked at where we're at. Uh, going into it, being a, a total novice, not having any, any, uh, oh, God, I, I get bumbled up. Uh, you know, having any uh, experience in, in publishing anything, uh, I like where we're at. I think we've done good things. Uh, I've learned a lot. And I think it's going to continue. And I think not knowing much about the publishing industry has helped us uh, connect with the with the people that we're working with because we are more fair than your average big publishing company. You know what I mean? A lot of indie publishers are are generous too, and they're just doing it. They're not making a lot of money, so that, I mean that's it. I just want I just want people to enjoy what we're putting out and respect what we're doing because we respect everybody that uh that deals with us yeah so that's it that's yeah. it whereas it's no secret that you're gonna get a bigger royalty if you go with an indie press as opposed to oh you know, one, of, one of the big four i mean and we do we you know since we've taken this distribution deal we've had to lower you know where you we were a 50 50 split uh but in order to pay for the marketing yeah, we, that's where it's coming out of it. But I think it's gonna, it's gonna work out in the author's favor because they're gonna get more exposure and they're gonna get more sales. So they may be taking, taking a little bit less royalty, but I think their sales are gonna more than double. You speak of awards, we, uh, you know, we did win that Splatterpunk for our very first book. So that, that really shocked me. Uh, and you know, we were up for a, another prestigious award this year that we didn't win which was a this is horror award for publisher of the year oh so, yeah <laughs> there yeah. you go yeah we were we were up for that uh and i think the fans that you know nominated us so yeah yeah that's and right. our authors won a few more splatter punks mm -hmm. yeah and i see it so stokers and shirley jackson awards there they're next yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think Death's Head Press is ever going to win a, a Stoker Award because they're not too friendly with the extreme end of things. Uh, now, if we branch out and get into more quiet horror, I think we stand a, a better chance. Uh, and Shirley Jackson, I, uh, I would love to win one of those or one of our authors to win one of those. That's uh, Let's hope that's next. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, particularly with the... The things you're doing with 
uh, Stygy and Sky, I mean, there's every chance that, yeah, you could be up for either the Stoker or the Shirley Jackson. Yep. Well, let's hope, you know, I'm not in it to win awards, but I, they don't hurt. Mm. And they look good on the, on the bookshelf. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm sitting there looking at, looking at my spl- our splatter punk right now. So, yeah. And then it does feel good to be recognized by your peers and by the people that you're putting this work out for. It's a, uh, it's a good feeling and it's good. Uh, it lets you know that you're doing something right. While I'm not out for awards, anybody, any award that wants to come my way, I will certainly uh, take the time to write an acceptance speech for. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's a, a good attitude to have. Right. I mean, and we're going to get a This Is Horror Award, too. You, you just wait. This year was the first year you saw us there, but we'll, you're going to be seeing a lot of us. So just get used to it. There you go. <laughs> Jared yes. took a big game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, well, you got to you got to have confidence in yourself. If you if you don't have self-confidence, then nobody else is going to have that for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. They can't. Uh, and. uh I like where we're at. I think we're doing good things, and I think we just continue. I think the world is going to be our oyster. It's, it's just that sort of thing. You just keep plugging away to the goal that you want, and eventually something's going to happen. It may not be everything that you envisioned it, but it's going to be better than where you're at now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder, going in a different direction... What advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? My 18-year-old self? That's right. Uh, oh, God. Uh, number one would be get your ass back in school and uh, get, get a little bit more knowledge before you head out into the world. Uh, while I, I've gleaned a lot of knowledge, it was it's sometimes, you know, there's good knowledge and then there's tough knowledge. And the tough knowledge is sometimes better, but it's really hard to get. Uh, it takes there's a cost to it. Uh, so mainly would be get a better education, uh, follow your dreams. You know, don't let anybody tell you that there's something that you can't do. Always, always uh, love yourself and treat people with respect all the time. And Quit smoking so much goddamn dope. <laughs> little hippie. So, that would be it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've always been a big fan of the uh, herbal refreshments. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough. Yeah. So my 18 year old self, what a dumb little bastard he was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. I think that's the way for most of us at 18. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the way it's, it really has to be. So, Because you know at 18, you knew everything, so any advice that your future self was going to give you, you're not going to listen to anyway. So Yeah. Uh, I know I didn't listen to many people when I was 18. I always have this vision when Michael asked that question, and then if I could actually be 18 and meet my future self, then and my future self came up to me and started you know telling me all these things that, that i needed to to know i'd kick future self's ass yeah exactly <laughs> i'd be like Get away from here, old you man. Don't know fuck yeah. and i would kick your ass so <laughs> it, it, it's like it, it, that could never happen. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, could never I would happen. never listen to him. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, shut up. What I'd do you like, know? Who's this fat dude? Get <laughs> yeah. out of here. You're not future me. Fuck off. Yeah, no. Yeah. Like, what happened to your hair? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. God, you yeah, you have no hair anymore. <laughs> so it looks like you ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh what should you be kinder to yourself about? Hmm. What should I be kinder to myself about? Uh, I, I would say be kinder to yourself about your failures because you learn, you learn a lot off your failures. I think I, I'm really one of those people who think you learn more off of your failures than you do your successes. 
Uh, it's just a matter of how you use the, the information you get from your failures uh, that really makes the difference. So that's what it'd be. I'd be yeah, I would let myself know that you're going to fail. Uh, don't get down on yourself for it. Just pick yourself up and, and keep going. Keep moving forward. Yeah. I mean, any true successes, they have to have failed a number of times to have got there. If you haven't failed enough, then you probably haven't achieved anything. Or you're just one lucky motherfucker. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, everybody's going to fail. Just how you deal with it is is what really separates success from true failure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is it. Well, what is it that frightens you? There's not much that frightens me. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's really, uh, I'm not really frightened about tangible things, you know, like, uh, you know, getting murdered or getting killed. It's the intangible things. Uh, I do worry. I, the future for my family frightens me uh, and taking care of them and making sure they're all taken care of. Uh Failure doesn't frighten me because, uh, like I said, I know that that's going to happen. Uh, just uh, letting people down, I guess, is my biggest fear, is not living up to to what I've told people that I'm going to achieve and that I'm going to achieve from them. Mm. So that would, that would be my biggest fear. Yeah, yeah. And not living up to my own expectations. Right, yeah. What do you hope people say about you when you're not in the room? Hmm. <laughs> oh, I've never, that, that's a good question because I've never even thought of that. Uh, what would I want people to say about me? Uh, I would want people just to say that, that he's a hardworking dude that, uh, that really treats people with respect. Uh, and I just, I, I like to have people's respect. And so I would hope that they would talk respectfully about me. He's a hard worker. Um, he's a man of his word. Uh, and he's really fucking good looking. <laughs> yeah. Why not fucking throw <laughs> that in? <laughs> did you, did you see the bulge in his pants? Oh, that's what, I mean. <laughs> that's what I say when I come out of publishing meetings i mean it's what people <laughs> comment on obviously <laughs> right of course great <laughs> yeah well fuck how the hell do you segue from the bulge in your pants <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think we just fucking move on and pretend that right. didn't happen <laughs> drop <laughs> drop the next one and and just move on yeah yeah do you have any personal philosophies that you live by? Oh, I guess I, I guess it goes back to what I, I said about the respect. Is my personal philosophy is to treat is it truly is to treat people like you want to be treated. Uh, treat everyone with a measure of respect, whether you you know them or not. Uh, always give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I I would I have complete faith in people until they, until they prove me wrong. Mm. So that's my philosophy is live like, treat people like everybody's honest until they prove you different. So yeah. That's, that's it, basically it. And, and take care of, take care of your responsibilities before you, you take care of your, your extracurricular activities, you know? Mm. So that's always been my philosophy. Yeah, I guess a lot of the respect and the work ethic all comes back to like your childhood. I mean, it sounds like this has been ingrained in you from an incredibly early age. It it, it was, uh, you know, from the from being left home alone to like my my stepdad was a, a taskmaster. Uh, so I always had the I always had chores. So I le I learned that it's best just to get in there and do them. Then, you know, him haul around about them, uh, just get in there and do your work. And then after that, enjoy yourself, enjoy what you did, what you accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I know that you're a big fan of survival horror video games, and as Bob and I love them too, it feels like, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention <laughs> this in the conversation. So I wonder, what was the first survival horror game that you played? Hmm. That, I mean, that's interesting. Uh, see, because, you know, I predate the really good video game systems, you know, so, but... I mean, actually, Pitfall on Atari 2600 was actually a survival horror game. It didn't have the graphics. You know, it was, uh, mm -hmm. I think it was 8-bit or something. I don't know. Uh, maybe 16-bit. But the first true survival horror game I played was Resident Evil. Yeah. That was, was any good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, w I loved it from the first time I turned it on, you know. Uh, and I still love it. So yeah. they can come out with as many as they want. I mean, because they're basically all the same, uh, but I'll play every one of them mm -hmm. until the end. In fact, I'm just right now, this uh, new one, uh, Back for Blood, I think, is downloading. So I'm about to hit that one up. Yeah, the moment in the original um resident evil where the hellhounds jump through at that corridor has to be yeah. one of the most iconic moments in like any video game i mean that was probably the first moment where it's like okay th this this is horror as this is cool as is the mm -hmm. name of this podcast but yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, and I think it's that's scarier than watching a movie is because you're controlling, you know, your character. So I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think I would prefer to play a horror video game than watch a horror movie. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's certainly more chance for it to literally get my heart racing because it's like, <laughs> shit, I got to deal with this, you know. Um it's in my control. And I think with that particular moment as well, it's like, had there really been a moment before then where the fucking enemy jumps through a window? It's like you're meant to be right. able to see them ahead or behind you. It's like they broke the rules. <laughs> right, yeah. This is not scrolling, you know. Uh, you can't see them. They're like 20 feet in front of you. Yeah, uh, it was an awesome game. And right now, I think, uh, and I'm hoping this virtual reality uh games improve and and get to be a thing because now i'm i'm playing while they're not virtual reality i have a virtual reality headset that i play my video games through so it's like right there and it's like a really immersive experience and i think that adds so much to the uh to the game especially when you have headphones in and you're hearing every little sound uh it just adds a whole new level to these games yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you play um, Resident Evil 7 with the VR? Uh, I think I tried it. I had, I had the, the PS4 VR thing. Uh, it just, it was real glitchy. Right. So I didn't really, I didn't really mess with it much. I, I, I got this Oculus system now, uh, and they have a couple of pseudo uh, survival horror, but nothing really that great. Uh, because the the technology just isn't there to to keep up with you know having a, a great game like that yeah uh, but i think they could do a lot with that if they could come up with a really good survival horror game that's totally immersive and you know i think that would be fantastic i think i would probably miss work for that you know? yeah so yeah. <laughs> i i uh, think it's coming in the future but you know like you said, we just got to kind of wait for the technology to be there and for it to be affordable enough for there to be, you know, a lot of demand for it. Absolutely. And I, I, I'm hoping I make it, even if I'm 75, I'm still going to buy that game system. Yeah. That's uh, how you're fucking dying. You're going to literally yeah. fucking pass out playing <laughs> one of these <laughs> things. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I turned 50 this year, so they're running out of time. They need to uh, they need to get their shit together. So, I reckon they can do it. They, I uh, think they can. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the technology is probably out there. It's just, like you said, making it affordable where people can, can uh, you know, get it. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. It's already come so far from Atari 2600, you know, uh, to the, the original PlayStation and the original Nintendo, uh, to where we are, to where we're at now. I mean, the video games are just incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, the biggest problem at the moment is just being able to make the PlayStation 5, you know, like right. the, there's way more demand than there are consoles. But I think, yeah, like uh, the pandemic really fucked up the distribution there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still haven't got one. So uh, I'm either. hoping. Yeah, yeah. I, I still, still got my old PlayStation 4, but it's mm -hmm. it's good enough. Uh, it's good enough. The kids, they all use the. They're all into the X, uh, Xbox uh, One, I guess mm -hmm. they have. Uh, so luckily, I don't have to suffer the humiliation of playing them online and getting my ass kicked. It's generally <laughs> little, little little kids from across the country uh, that are kicking my ass. Nobody I know. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I've never gotten really into the Xbox. Um, I, just I, I really did get. This. I didn't. I didn't get into the Xbox either. I've I've always been a PlayStation person. You know, you've got PlayStation people. You've got Xbox people. Yeah. I've always been PlayStation. And you got greedy motherfuckers like me that have both of them. But I mean, uh, if I yeah. have to, if I have to nail my allegiance, then it's all about PlayStation. You know, if I was told you have to get rid of one of them, sorry yeah. Microsoft, but uh, that Xbox is going out the window because. You know, why not, why not be dramatic about it? <laughs> You're in Japan where, where they're much more electrocentric than we are. So you're in the motherland. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. I mean, the, the PlayStation is for all the kind of serious gamers and the adult gamers. And then all the children are about the Nintendo Switch. Oh, my God. I've never even seen one of those. Man, that's... The Switch is cool. I want to say that. It's pretty. I have a friend who has one, and uh, he brought it to work, and he was my coworker, and uh, and I got in trouble for for playing with it because he said, "Ah, yeah. man, he was the manager. He was like, oh, man, just play with it, man. We're slow." So I sat in the back for a couple hours. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, and uh, yeah, and didn't realize. And then the district manager came in and caught me. I was like, "Oh, I was just checking it out and everything." And he was like, "Yeah, I've been out there for about forty five minutes." I'm like, oh, <laughs> "Wait, no, yeah." Me. Really? <laughs> so I handed it I've to been, him. I said, "You should check it out." And he goes, "He goes, oh, I am." <laughs> right. That's good. Yeah, I, I, I need a job like that. I'm I'm scared to watch a YouTube video at work. So, yeah. Well, I work in tech, so it's kind of you know. Yeah. Well, that's a good. I, thing. I sell Should cell like. phones, so we have to you know we have to kind of know. But I mean, shit, dude. Most of the time, our clientele's some days it's kind of old. We have to explain to older people we don't know your Facebook password, but you know uh, what I mean. Yeah, I don't even it's know a, my Facebook password. <laughs> you should know it. You should just delete it. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, I swear, if if like this password save thing ever crashed on my phone or my computer, I would be completely <laughs> fucked. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. mm -hmm. usually I go with, "Do you want this strong password?" Hell yeah! You know, forty-seven <laughs> characters. I'm never going to remember that shit. Yeah. yeah. It's like the VIN number to your car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, not only is, is a crook not going to get it, neither am I ever again. So, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the password thing is, is pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us for the majority of your evening. This has been a hell of a lot of fun and really informative oh, yeah. getting to know you and getting to know you know about Deaf Heads Press and Stygian Sky and your future plans. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. This is this has been one of my, my bucket list podcasts and uh, I'll, anytime y'all want me back, just uh, say the word. Uh, I am here. It's, right. been a, it's been a good time. Uh, some original questions. That I've never been asked before, uh, so it's been really interesting for me too. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. All right. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? 
Well, you can connect it. We our, our individual websites are www.stygianskymedia.com or www.deathheadpress.com. Uh, we're on Twitter at Deathhead Press uh, and at Stygian Sky Media. Uh, my personal email address is Jared at Stygian Sky uh, If you have any questions, just hit me up. All right. Do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Final thoughts? Uh, other than buy, obey, consume. Uh, no, uh, just uh, check us out, man. We're on the way up. Uh, I think we do great things for the community, and the community does great things for us. Uh, give us a chance, and uh, we guarantee you will become a fan. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with Yara Barbie. Join us again next time for a very special episode. And we have two great conversations kicking off 2022. We've got Cat Barb Magera, the author of Poe For Your Problems. And we have got a conversation with the writer of The Greasy Strangler and Come To Daddy, Toby Harvard. So those are two do not miss conversations on This Is Horror. And you won't miss them and you will in fact get them ahead of the crowd. If you become a patron at patreon.com forward slash This Is Horror. Check it out. Many bonuses, many perks and a great way to support the podcast and keep it alive. And it's not been the easiest 2021 well, it's been the only 2021, so I should rephrase that. It's not been the easiest year for me, and so I guess there's been a knock-on consequence for this as horror and the podcast, but we've made it through. Here we are, and we're not stopping. We're going to have a great 2022. I will be sure of that. Lots of good conversations coming up, and if you want to be part of the family, as I said, it's patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Malene by Josh Schlossberg from DT Publishing. The absent mindedness, the nonsensical ramblings, the blank stares. Ward Ayers, physically disabled and confined to his Jersey Shore home, can only watch in dismay as his beloved wife, Melene, slips further and further into dementia. Until finally, Ward uncovers a dark force behind Melene's decline and must plumb the depths of sacrifice and selfishness to reclaim his wife and preserve humanity's future. Find Melene in paperback, hardcover, ebook, or audiobook online or at a bookstore near you. And if you want to get your advert featured on This Is Horror, if you have a book to promote, a film to promote, a publishing company to promote, or indeed anything that you think would be a good fit for our audience, then drop me a line, michael at thisishorror.co.uk, and I'll send you those advertising rates, and we can see if it's a good fit for you. Now, as we approach a new year, a lot of people talk about fresh starts and new beginnings and I mean that's great it is wonderful that we can take this time to set our goals and start afresh but what about those who are in the middle of a battle or conflict or problem what about for those who starting afresh is just not possible at this time because you're fighting something and that is something I've been thinking about and yeah, I have a few things to say about that. And I guess as a writer and a creative, I do often think about life as a story. A little bit like 
the hero's journey. And so for those who are embroiled in conflict, who are going through something at the moment, you're just in the trenches. You're in the hard part of the story, the real meat of the conflict, the real unrelenting battle. And because you're in the thick of it, it may be that, you know, you, you can't see that bright light or it's so far in the distance, you're not sure what it is. And, you know, that's okay. Keep fighting. Keep doing your best because there is a resolution. There is something positive. You just can't see it yet. And as Jack Ketchum, Dallas Mayer, would often say, when you've got a decision to make, go with the good. Always go with the good. Always do the best that you can. Keep fighting. So many people love you. So hang in there, folks. So until the next episode, until 2022, take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.